welcome again uh, so uh, today again we are uh, continuing the module 4 uh, for uh, water supply and sanitation last class we had discussed about uh, wellness products so this is the last part of uh, the first topic in uh, module 4 so uh, we will see what are the bath and water fixtures. So, in that first and foremost is taps. Taps are devices by which a flow of liquid or gas from a pipe or a container can be controlled. So, that means the uh, taps is nothing, ta tap is nothing but where it uh, allows flow of liquid or gas from a pipe and also we can control the flow. So, that is the tap basically used for. A tap is also called as spigot. It can also be called as spigot or it can also be called as faucet. Right? So, it is a valve controlling the release of a liquid or a gas. You can also explain about tap in this manner. Bip taps, this is uh, something which is very common. Bip tap is uh, uh, fixed to the wall with a back plate. Bib tap is nothing but you see the uh, captain's head like this that is the lever or captain's uh, the opening knob will be like that. The basic idea of tap is only this much that it will have a opening knob or a lever or a captain's head. Bib tap is usually where you have this uh, captain's head and it will have a spindle connected to that the knob or uh, lever will be connected to the spindle. If you see this is the spindle, right? And it has a gland net packing head and body, head and body of the ta tap and uh, it has this spindle at the bottom has a jumper and washer and it has a seating. The seating is this one which is in the body, body of the tap. So, what happens is when the captain's head is removed that means when it is rotated and this spindle moves up and down, this spindle moves up and down when this is rotated or even if it is a lever it opens up and uh, if it is a tap, uh, if it is a openable lever like this it will move up and down. Basically the spindle is the main, uh, uh, main thing which is there in the cap taps to allow the release of water or a gas, liquid or a gas. So, this is a cross section of uh, pillar ta tap. So, here what we see in the earlier bib tap, we saw the spindle coming throughout the top of the tap till the center of the tap. So, that when it moves above the water flows the water which is flowing here can move like that, right? Similarly, here we have a smaller spindle in this kind where you see it as a knob. The top portion will be like a knob. Here the top portion will be like a rotatable thing which is going up and down connected to the spindle. Here the knob, there will be a knob on the top, tap which you can open it up. So, while rotating the knob, this spindle moves up or down. So, here what happens? It will have uh, similar components are there, but the water which is going is going through this, right? So, this is called as pillar tap. Uh, these taps can be made of brass, gunmetal or other corrosion resisting alloys. They should be usually corrosion resisting alloys. Whatever metal, whatever metal you use for making taps other than plastics, it has to be corrosion resistant. They may be made of casting metal into molds or by hot pressing metal between dies. How it is made is what they are trying to say. So, bath and water fixture may we have one more thing which is called as pillar tap. We saw the cross section of pillar tab. Here you can see how it can be seen. You have a knob in a knob which is turning around and here you have a lever kind of a thing which you can move up and move down. 
but the tap is bow like this above the spindle. But in the bib tap, the tap is below the spindle. So, they are mounted on basin or a bath with separate taps and for hot and cold water. It can be both separate or even mixtures. And then we have mixer taps in uh, bath and water, fixture, water fixtures. Mixer taps are nothing but we have two, two knobs, two taps connected like this. One is for hot water, one is for cold water or it could be single tap where internally the water will be connected directly in the pipe and the mixed water will come directly here. But the movement of the liver tells you which direction it has to be mixed, what how much quantity it has to be mixed, right. So, we have two inlets, one is cold water inlets and another one is hot water inlet. Then the mixed outlet is what we are getting from this tap. In this middle portion, the water gets mixed in this kind of taps, right. So, the mixer tap for use when both and hot water supplies are at equal pressures. This mixing at the pipe and having a mixed water coming out of the tap, out of the tap is possible only if there is a equal pressure of water released for both hot water and cold water. If there is a equal pressure, then only it can be managed. Mixer taps are designed to deliver hot and cold water through a common spout. Common spout is nothing but the opening which is where the water is coming from. So, it is a common thing for both hot and water, hot water. If uh, hot water is required, co cold water tap has to be closed, cold water knob has to be closed. If cold water is required, only cold water is required, hot water knob has to be closed or if it has to be mixed, the proportion has to be checked, heat, uh, heat and cold water proportion has to be checked and after that you can open up the taps. The mixed water will come out of the spout. There are two basic designs for mixer taps in which first one the hot and cold water is mixed in the tap, right and mixed in the tap body or spout either in the body or directly in the tap or in the spout it is mixed. So, it is called as single outlet mixer and the second one is those in which the hot and cold water do not actually mix until it is discharged from the outlet nozzle. It does not mix until it comes out of the nozzle, right. Till it comes out, it will be separately coming out, then only after it releases from the tap, it is mixed. So, that is called as double outlet mixer. The first type is only suitable for where the hot and cold supply water is having equal pressure. Failure to observe this could result in the water having greater pressure flowing back down to the other feed pipe. So, if there is a pressure differences in any one of the cold water or hot water, it can go back to the other feed pipe. Feed pipe. So, this results unsatisfactory water flows discharging from the nozzle outlet. This is another type of uh, mixing where mixing does not take place in the tap directly. It has to come out only then it can be mixed. So, you see from the hot inlet it goes directly to the separate to the same pipe, but there will be a separate connection. There will be a division in between you see this line, right. So, that kind of line is there that means there is a clear separation of pipes, but it looks like as if it is one pipe. Mixing does not take place in the tap, hotlet separate, cold inlet separate. Mixer tap suitable for unequal pressures, if there is unequal pressures this is easily usable. So, there is no, pro, uh, no problem in getting continuous water. Then we have single liver taps single liver taps are nothing but you just have one liver in uh, any in any direction towards the side towards the top towards vertically place but it has to be single liver should be only single so single liver taps work with just one liver to control the water usually you will have to turn the tap to the right 
to get progressively gold, colder water and turn towards the left to get progressively hot water. However, you can also preset the water temperature through a lever on the side. So, here it is again for mixer, but you have only one lever. Earlier what we saw is you have two knobs or two levers, two levers for separate pipes, but it is a common thing, common mixer which is having only one lever. So, if you shift it towards left, if you turn the lever towards left, you get one type of water, turn towards the right, you get one type of water and uh, for mixing there will be one, uh, this level has to be lifted. Then we have uh, tap which has traditionally faucets with the washer needs at least two and half spins to get the water pressure up to maximum cap capacity. This is quarter turn taps. You can turn the tap only quarter, quarter. It does not turn 90 degree, it can just turn quarter or it does not turn 180 degree. The lever or the knob or handle whatever is provided, this will turn only quarter. These levers will turn only quarter, so they are called quarter turn lever taps, right. So, they are also called as quarter turn taps. Quarter turn taps are, taps are made of ceramic discs and need just a 90 degree rotation to operate at full capacity. If we turn it towards 90 degree, it will be full capacity water is allowed or outlet is there. So, the next product is bathtub. Bathtub, the general dimensions of bathtub is, the width of the bathtub is 150 centimeter where you can just lie down with the back, push back, kind of a push back and uh, uh, depth is 80 centimeter where you can easily uh, uh, stretch out your arms and sit and uh, the height of the bathtub from the floor level is 60 centimeter, that is 2 feet. So, from the floor level, the bottom of this hand which is coming out of the bottom should be 59 centimeter, around 2 feet. There are different types of bathtubs. So, there is something called as drop-in bathtub. This is nothing but drop-in bathtubs. That means, uh, somebody has to get into the bathtub from outside. So, in this drop-in bottoms is built into a large frame that is set into an alcove. Alcove, alcove is nothing but a space Okay. Alco is uh, okay. Alco is nothing but a space where you have a projection towards inside or outside. So your bathtub could just sit directly into that alco. This could be alco. That means like a cabinet which has gone inside. Right? So, the bathtub, these kind of drop-in bathtubs are mostly built in these alcoves. They often come with their own rim that is larger than the limited rims in alcove tubs. Although tubs come in various shapes and sizes, you could have uh, um, rectangular, you could have square, you could have circular, you could have uh, semicircular, oval shape. So, the bathtubs are available in various shapes. The standard or commonly seen bathtub is able to hold around 80 gallons of water, that is 302 liters of water it can hold. A bath uses 35 gallons of, 35 to 50 gallons of water, which means 132 
to 189 liters of water is used while we are using this bathtub, right. In the earlier discussion, we saw that if it is a bucket, 15 liters, if we are using a shower, it is 25 liters. Now we can see that bathtub is using for one bath, it uses around 132 to 189 liters of water. So, that is about uh, bathtubs, drop in bathtubs, alcove bathtubs. Generally, this uh, number is common for most of the bathtubs, 132 to 189 liter water is used for every bath in uh, all kinds of bathtubs mostly. So, there are different types of bathtubs available, alcove bathtubs as I earlier mentioned that uh, there is an alcove space, if you have an alcove space, it can be pushed into that alcove. So, most common type that is, which is often a built in tub shower combo surrounded by three walls, you would have three walls. So, it saves the space in smaller bathrooms. Then we have corner bathtubs, then we have corner bathtubs, a corner tub is a triangular bathtub that is inserted into the corner of your bathroom. They can take up a lot of floor space and are generally found in large master bed bathrooms. Then we have freestanding bathtub, freestanding bathtub is just an uh, appliance which can be taken and inserted in any space. So, it does not need alcove, it does not need corner anywhere, even any space it could be installed easily. So, a freestanding tub is a large standalone tub that is not built into the walls of a room. Freestanding tubs are usually found in large bathrooms and comes in a variety of styles. Then we have under mount bathtub, like how we had under mount kitchen sink. So, similarly we have under mount bathtub, under mount bathtub is similar to drop in bathtub except that its rim is covered with tile or stone framing. So, what happens is? So, this is the rim, rim is the edge of the bathtub on the top surface. So, that rim would be covered with tiles, tiles or something else, anything in the undermount bathtub, right. So, that is inserted into the another constructed uh, space. An undermount tub is usually 60 inches long, 30 inches wide and 16 inches deep, 1 feet 3 inches around 1 feet 3 inches deep. So, then we have soaking bathtub, a soaking tub is a kind of freestanding bathtub that you can place anywhere in your bathroom. Japanese soaking tubs, these are the ideas of ideology of Japanese are a popular choice of modern bathrooms requiring the bather to sit upright rather than lounging at an angle. In all the other bathtubs, human could lounge in the bath, in the bathtubs, but in this soaking bathtubs, the person has to sit upright, he has to sit upright in the bathtub. So, requiring the bather to sit upright rather than lounging at an angle. These tubs may have seats installed inside along their edges depending on the depth of the tub. So, to sit, seat could be installed. Then we have whirlpool bathtub which is very common nowadays, is an acrylic bathtub that takes up a similar amount of space as an alcove tub, where a whirlpool tub usually uses air or water jet streams for a hydrotherapy effect that can keep your water warmer for longer amount of time. So, like jacuzzi, how I was explaining in the last session about the jacuzzi, uh, this also could be one of that whirlpool bathtub. Then we have multi jet bath in bathtubs. So, in this multi jet bath is nothing but it is an idea of a jacuzzi which has been taken here and uh, jacuzzi is something which is done for medical treatment human on the human body. This is to massage, uh, massage themselves 
in the, in their requirement. So, this could be installed instead of bathtub, normal bathtubs. So, this delivers optimal hydro massage experience. A jetted tub must have a combination of jet types installed in a strategically placed clusters that match bathers body contours and mimic the variation massages uh, intended to deliver invigorating hydrotherapy treatment for each body part. So, here just one image is being shown to you. So, how the water is jetting to the body. So, this, this bathtub has to be designed the, such that for the shape of the body, it has to uh, fit appropriately for massaging. So, there are some few standards, few standard which is based on average uh, dimensions of a human body. So, there are standard sized multi jet baths available in the market. Multi jet bath is also available in uh, oval shape, right. So, there are air massages happening at the bottom and if you see these are the body portions which get gets massages when a human human is using this multi jet bath. Which are those parts multi jet baths means human will get a back massage, hands, side massage, air massage in this kind of uh, oval shaped uh, jet bath, air massage for the knees, side massage for complete length leg and also foot massage will be available. So, this will be the portions where you get massages for from these. So, this multi jet bath has mac, back massager 1, back massager 2, then electronic bath, bath filer, wireless RC, hydro massage water intake, heating circulation water intake, chromotherapy, drain from the bottom, overflow from the side can be handled, foot, foot massage towards the bottom, side massages, these blue lines represent the side massages, hand shower also can be used and electronic mixer, mixers can be used for these to control the hot and cold water. So, this is about mat jet massage. Then we have rain shower. Rain shower is nothing but it is just an experience given for, for the shower, something which is very similar as rain shower. A rain shower is, is a head which you see as a, uh, the design of this, what this particular image what I am showing is like a rectangular sleek plate, but you can get it in different uh, sizes, different shapes and different designs. So, rain shower is nothing but you have the shower in this format. So, rain shower head will sprinkle low pressure, the water which is poured in from this are very low pressure, will be having low pressure water down directly on top of your head, on top of the head it directly pours, giving the feeling of showering in a gentle rain. It feels like you are taking a shower or somebody is taking a shower in a gentle rain. A regular shower head will provide a much higher pressure. Regular showers what we have uh, which is an older design will have higher pressure streams with multiple spray options. They also look quite different as well. Then we have health facade, health facet, health facet as I said in this uh, presentation itself. Faucet is also a, another name for taps. So, health facets are essentially handheld nozzles with a trigger which enables the delivery of a spray of water. These are connected to a water source through a pipe near the toilet. In between uses the nozzles is uses in between uses the nozzle is placed in a stand attached to the wall. You can see this it will have a hand jet hand spray uh, trigger and then the pipe and this will be connected on the wall, Spray, uh, the uh, trigger will be placed on the wall. 
that is about uh, that is about the fixtures used in the uh, plumbing. Now, uh, this will be your last part in module 4 that is solid waste management. So, in solid waste management what all we are discussing is about the assessment of waste, how the waste all different kinds of waste which is produced is assessed that one and waste to wealth concept how that can be converted wastes can be converted into wealth. This is a common concept which has been used worldwide and uh, we can discuss uh, we discuss about municipal waste, we can discuss about garden waste, organic and inorganic waste, commercial waste, medical waste, industrial waste and how collection, segregation, treatment, disposal of solid waste management, especially we are mostly talking about solid waste only. So, solid waste management is happening in this particular uh, cities or zones. So, and how the organic waste can be converted into a wealth through the processes of biomethanation, vermicomposting or organic waste converter. So, any one of these we can look into in detail. So, solid waste management. So, to understand how the management of solid waste, this solid waste is a huge issue or a problem we can call it as in the cities to manage them. So, solid waste management is a huge crisis uh, to handle. So, it has some kind of process set already to manage them. Even now people are trying to find some good solutions to manage the solid waste produced in the cities and uh, urban areas. So, to know that we have to find out what kind of wastes are produced in solid waste. So, to know that uh, we will first look into what is solid waste. Solid waste is uh, nothing but it is a useless unwanted and discarded material resulting from day to day activities in the community. Solid waste management may be defined as the discipline associated with the control of generation, how the generation happens, how to control the generation itself, the storage and collection transfer once it is collected, once the waste is collected it has to be transferred for further process transfer and how the processing can be done and the disposal of solid waste. Finally, it has to be disposed, certain amount of solid waste has to be disposed. So, these are the processes involved in the solid waste management. So, solid waste is the, how can we define solid waste is? It is just nothing but useless, unwanted and discarded material which is resulting from day to day activities in the community or our lives. So, how do we assess these waste? Solid waste is produced from all different places daily basis. So, how can it be assessed? A waste assessment identifies waste generated at a facility and purchasing and management practices. It examines current waste reduction practices and assesses their effectiveness. First and foremost, it examines how much waste reduction is happening, how much a facility is trying to reduce a waste. So, and assesses their effectiveness. It also identifies the areas and materials in which waste reduction efforts will be most effective. A waste assessment, it is also a kind of visual analysis of your facility that should identif identify four types of information that are vital to your operations. The quantity and type of waste that is found in the facility, assessment of waste, first and foremost thing is what? to check the quantity and type of waste, what kind of waste that is found in the facility. Say for example, at a residential apartment, the quantity will be huge. Say for example, if you have four apartments in one particular zone, the 
four slats which produces the waste will have all types of waste. It will have wet waste, it will have dry waste, it will have uh, e-waste. So, all different types of waste could be produced. So, similarly, if we compare the waste produced, solid waste produced in the commercial zone, then the type of waste is different. So, say shopping malls and all, the waste will be mostly dry type, wet wastes are reduced except for the food, food court, uh, the waste which has been produced from the food court, the most of the areas produce dry waste. So, similarly, the quantity and type of waste has to be assessed in any kind of facility. Then the next step is the main types of waste. What are the main types of waste which is produced in but that particular facility is what we have to check. Then the current systems in place to deal with waste on site. What are the current systems they have produced, they have created to deal with the waste on the site. Say for example, even on the streets, uh, streets of the cities we see people coming and collecting the waste, that is a good initiation which has been taken by the government and uh, while they come, they also insist people to separate the dry waste and wet waste so that it can be disposed of easily and managed or treated easily at the later stages. So, uh, based on the system, it has been dealt how to separate the waste on the site. So, there were lot of syst systems already existing to manage the waste, solid waste. So, that is something which you, which we have to check. The current systems in place to deal with the waste on the site. What systems could be adapted is what we have to check based on the type of waste which is generated in that particular facility. Then, how it leaves your facility? Last one is, what happens to the residues or how the facility is remaining? So, the first step of assessment of waste is to measure your facility's waste. First and foremost is quantity measurement. What measurement, what quantity that particular facility is producing? What waste quantity is being produced by that particular facility has to be measured. Second step is to figure out ways to reduce the amount of waste that is being carried to the landfill. Landfill is the common issue with the solid waste. The solid waste even though there are most of the places, most of the cities where landfills are happening in huge amount. So, to reduce that, what is the steps taken? What are the steps taken? So, to figure out how you can reduce the landfill is the second step. The third step is to identify your local haulers, recyclers and collectors for the waste materials your facility is generating. That is something which is very important. Local haulers, recyclers and collectors. There are lot of people, at least in Indian context, there are lot of people who come in front of the house and they try to collect different wastes like paper, e-waste and uh, waste like plastic. They come and collect it separately and go. So, these kind of activities are there already in place. So, that has to be identified and the facility has to make sure that these kinds of wastes are separated. And some of the waste like clothing and other things could be recycled. So, that has to be found out. Local haulers are somebody who comes on the way and collect all these. So, third step should be identifying them should be the third step. Then the fourth step is to determine if the bins set up for waste materials and or recyclables are set up in the appropriate place. Bins, waste bins, dust bins are very, very important. Where it is placed, what size it is placed, whether it is capable of taking that much load which has been put on that particular facility. So, that is something which has to be checked out and whether it is in appropriate place, right. So, those are the key elements or steps which has to be followed 
to at least assess. By doing this, how do you assess what happens is the segregation of the waste is happened and the waste materials are discarded easily without without going into the landfill, very less will might go into the landfill, very less quantity of the waste which is produced at your facility can go into the landfill. Most of the other waste will be handled. You can also assess how much quantity of waste has been produced by that facility in particular day or a year or a month. There are few steps which we had to be for which has to be followed while doing this waste misses, waste assessment management. So, uh, first defining the scope and goal of the asset assessment. Why why the assessment in the first place has to happen? That is what tells you how you can go ahead with the waste management. So, define the scope and goal of the assessment. The aspect could be social aspect, environmental aspect, economical aspect. It could be to reduce the environmental aspect, economical aspect or increase the social aspect, whatever. The object of investigation will be waste prevention, waste collection, waste prevention, waste collection, waste recycling, treatment plants, waste management streams, systems and waste streams. So, first and foremost is waste prevention, how waste prevention, can, how producing waste can be prevented, that is the first investigation which is done, objective of uh, assessment. Second objective is waste collection, how the collection produced waste can be collected. Third objective is how it can be recycled, fourth objective is how it can be treated. And fifth objective is what is the waste management system to be applied in that particular facilities. Receivers, there are receivers at the other side. So, need to identify who are those. Those receivers could be government, operators, citizens, researchers. So, that has to be identified. Then second step is select an assessment method considering the goal. Now, these are the goals, objectives are this, these are the aspects and identify, receivers are identified. Now, which method has to be followed to get the, to achieve the goal is what is the second step. So, select an assessment method considering the goal. So, assessment methods. There are n number of assessment methods which can be used for waste management. So, few of them are mentioned here. They are like life cycle assessment, statistical entropy analysis, benchmarking, energy analysis, environmental impact assessment, which is the common assessment done especially for solid waste management, EIA, environmental impact assessment. Life cycle costing, cost benefit analysis, cost effective analysis, strategic environmental analysis, energy analysis, risk assessment, multi criteria decision making, eco efficiency analysis, new method, if any new method. These are the existing methods, if there are any new methods, how it could be applied also. It might not even fall under any of this, it could be a mix of few. So, that also can be added on to the assessment methods. So, uh, there is something called as waste to wealth concept, where worldwide people are trying to adapt it in their particular cities for reducing the waste and to reduce the environmental impact. So, the waste to wealth is a mission. Waste to wealth mission is one of the nine scientific missions of the Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council. This is with respect to Indian context is what I am mentioning here. There is a mission 
in India Waste to Wealth Mission, which is one of the nine scientific missions. There are nine scientific missions in that this is one of it, which is of the primary Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advance Advisory Council, PMSTIAC. There is a website also where you can go through and check out what is happening in this mission already. So, this mission aims to identify, develop and deploy technologies to treat waste and ways to generate energy, recycle materials and extract resources of value. This mission will assist and augment the Swachh Bharat and Smart City projects by leveraging science, technology and innovation to create circular economic models that are financially viable for waste management to streamline waste handling in the country. So, the main mission of this is uh, assist and augment the Swachh Bharat. Swachh Bharat Abhiyan which has been started by our Prime Minister and the Smart Cities projects. So, this also gives a way to assist and augment those two by leveraging science and technology and innovation to create circular economic models. This is the concept which is be, which has to be adapted in uh, managing this waste, circular econo economic models has to be adapted in managing the waste which are financially viable for waste management to streamline waste handling in the country. So, if we are ad able to adapt circular economic models in managing the waste, it streamlines waste handling in the country. A lot of uh, reduction of waste will be there. Landfill will be reduced at the most. This mission will also work to identify and support the development of modern technologies that promise to create a clean and green environment. That is the final aim of it. It has to provide, uh, create clean and green environment. Waste to wealth mission, mission, sorry, waste to wealth mission brings scientific processing of waste to the forefront to build as a zero landfill and zero waste nation. The goal of that waste to wealth mission is to bring zero landfill into the forefront and zero waste nation to the forefront. So, the aim is that India to be zero landfill and zero waste nation. This SIDBI that is small and this is one example which has been taken from the waste to wealth uh, mission. mission. So, Small Industries Development Bank of India, SIDBI, Small Industries Development Bank of India has launched this waste to wealth creation program for women, especially for women in Sundarbans zone, Sundarban area in West Bengal. In this, the women will make ornaments. What do they do is from the waste generated over there, they create ornaments and show pieces from the fish scales. They use fish scales and create ornaments and show pieces. Women use fish scales and create ornaments and show pieces. SIDB, that is Small Industries Development Bank of India, will extend benefits to 50 women indirectly generating revenues from alternative livelihoods. Under this program, later, these women are expected to become a trainer. So, they train 50 women, they extend benefits to 50 women at the first and they are expected to become trainer for replicating and disseminating the knowledge what have what they have acquired in the mission in the scheme. So, this is a part of mission Swavalamban of SIDBI that aims to support artisans to become sustainable. That is to promote artisans and to aim at sustainability.
So, one of that, uh, one more example is uh, Farida, Faridpur, Bangladesh. What they do is turning thin plastics into power. They turn these thin plastics which is available, which is produced as a waste into power. A new project will use cutting edge technology called pyrolysis to turn waste plastic into two valuable commodities. An oil that can be used as a fuel and black carbon which is used in print cartridges. They use these thin plastics and convert it into an oil which can be used as a fuel and they break this plastics into black carbon and which can be used in printing cartridges, right. So, the innovative processes makes it possible to recycle thin polythene plastics. Thin polythene plastics is what they are using, plastic covers. It is banned already, but somewhere it can be converted into the power also. So, this is what is being tried by Faridapur. Right. So, the innovative processes makes it possible to recycle thin polythene plastics, a material that is not widely recycled and is therefore ignored by plastic collectors because it cannot correctly be currently be sold on for a profit. These people who come and collect these haulers, local haulers what they do, they do not collect this plastics or those plastics are thrown away. So, instead of that because they do not generate any profit for those local haulers. So, instead of that it is used as a power. So, the process what they use is pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is a method what they use for converting plastic into useful product. So, what does it mean is pyrolysis is a type of chemical recycling that combines an absence of oxygen with high temperatures of between 500 and 600 degrees centigrade. By using this process, we convert the plastic waste into pyrolysis oil. Once it gets heated up, it converts into oil which is similar to diesel, but it is not a diesel, but it is very, very similar to diesel, but it is more like a mix of diesel and gasoline. This can be used in engines. The other example is from poo and potato peelings to compost. They make use these potato peelings and poo to compost, right. So, we set up a treatment center in Faridpur which produce this examples are directly taken from the website. So, it can be referred if required. So, we uh, they have a treatment center in Faridpur which produces an extremely rich compost made from a mixture of toilet and kitchen waste. This co-compost adds nutrients to the soil and does not result in soil degradation over time like chemical fertilizer does. For extra nutrients, they just add worms. So, that is also called as vermiculture pro compost. They just add worms to the compost which is generated which is prepared from the waste which is generated in kitchen and toilet. So, for extra nutrients they add worms, the, that becomes a vermiculture compost. Example 3, what they do is, uh, another example is only 1 percent of the waste in Sweden, in Sweden city, it is said that, the research says that only 1 percent of the waste which is generated in the whole city ends up in landfills. How does it happen? So, what happens is source segregation is the main strategy behind this. So, at the source itself the waste has to be segregated. So, that means say for example, if it is a residence, there is a wet waste, dry waste. Even in dry waste, there are different categories. It could be plastic, it could be paper, it could be uh, uh, wires, it could be e-waste. So, the categories has to be separated at the source itself. The majority of households separate the waste into various categories. Sweden has just ju justified garbage is cold. They, have, they, they call it garbage as a cold by generating energy from its waste 
and has significantly reduced its carbon emission. And the fourth example is various Indian cities also have tried to utilize this waste into wealth. Alapura, that is, which is in Kerala, and Panaji in Goa. It also uses, uh, they reduce the operating cost through source segregation. The, so, the key element is source segregation. If the segregation happens at the source, it is very, very easier to manage the waste. So, Mysuru, which is the place in Karnataka, is also applying the scientific techniques to turn biodegradable garbage into compost. So, here also, in Mysuru, they use this biodegradable garbage into compost to making it as a compost. Paradeep, which is in Odisha, they also have adapted decentralized and community driven model with micro composting centers and material recovery facilities. This micro composting centers has been formed to uh, manage the waste. The last example. Uh, the Gazipur landfill in Delhi has grown 65 meters. Imagine that the Gazipur la uh, landfills are very dangerous to any city or any part of the world. So, it in Gazipur, 65 meters landfill is there, uh, just a little short of height of the Kutubmir and covers an area of 70 acres. The problem is the land landfills creates leeches and it extends towards the deep ground and so, uh, spoils the water level, water table and harms the water table. So, that is the main issue of landfill. So, that has to be avoided. But there are enough examples globally where such types of landfills are generated, electricity and gas for the city. So, in Seoul, South Korea is the best example to tell how the landfills are generated to electricity and gas for the city. So, the last example is the construction of off-grid sewage treatment plants, STPs, has been very successful in so small township areas. The best examples are Tamil Nadu Police Housing Colony and the President's Estate in New Delhi. They have constructed large STPs to manage the uh, sewage treatment plants. So, this sewage treatment facility resolves the issues of sewage disposal, but it also has given a pond to treated water for fishing, vegetable farming, gardening and groundwater recharge. So, the waste which is generated from sewage treatment water, that is the treated water is used for fishing, vegetable farming, gardening, groundwater recharge in large amount. So, these are few examples to quote how waste can be utilized to wealth. Now, we will see, look into the other details, different types of waste in the next session. Thank you.